Uh, my name is Blake Tuchet. I'm the Teacher Support Partnership Specialist for the National Center for Science Education, uh, and I'll be leading you through this discussion today. Uh, so the National Center for Science Education uh, is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to help to ensure that all students receive uh, a full and accurate science education uh, and have the ability to engage with evidence on socially, but not scientifically controversial topics. Uh, and today I'm going to walk you through the first part of our logic model on how we do that. Uh, so you can see that this is a pretty complex model that we um, have borrowed from Dole and Sinatra's research uh, on reconstructing knowledge. Uh, and I'm going to be using the term misconception here uh, to basically mean any time a student or, or a person has a concept uh, or understanding of something that doesn't fully fit with our current understanding of that scientific concept. Um, so there are lots of different words in the literature for this um, that mean specific things. So we could have existing conceptions, preconceptions, uh, naive conceptions, uh, but I'll just be using the term misconception as kind of an umbrella term to catch all of those. And we'll talk a little bit more about the different types of misconceptions in a second. Um, so you can see that uh, tackling student misconceptions and helping students resolve those and come to a full understanding of the scientific concepts is a complex process. Um, so there are lots of different pieces that are in motion here, uh, lots, of, lots of different things that students need to understand uh, and that teachers need to understand about their students and the way in which they're delivering the information. Uh, so we're going to start with one of the most important parts of this, which is the student or the learner. Um, so the first step in resolving a misconception is understanding what misconceptions students are bringing into the classroom, uh, because we know that students are not blank slates that come in ready to just soak up everything that we're giving them. Um, students come in with a wide variety of, of background, uh, experiences, different background knowledge, uh, different understandings for, for how the world is, is working. Um, so there are three major parts that we need to understand when we're looking at the students' existing conceptions or the misconceptions that they might be coming into the classroom with. Uh, the first is the strength of that misconception. So is the misconception the students bringing into the classroom well-formed and detailed? Uh, do they hold a good picture of it in their mind already, or is it weak and fragmented? So are they tenuously holding on to this misconception? Uh, the second piece is coherence. Uh, so this refers to how well does the student's misconception provide an explanation that fits together with all of the evidence? Um, so is it coherent with everything else that they believe and understand about science? Um, and is it coherent with the evidence that they are going to be uh, digging through and working with in the classroom? Uh, or, you know, if, if we're talking about an adult and not a student, is that person's misconception coherent uh, with all other evidence that they might receive from the news or the media uh, or their, their friends and family? Um, if it's incongruent with uh, other existing evidence, um, then it's going to be a little bit easier to resolve. Um, and the last part of understanding a learner's uh, misconception is their commitment to that misconception. Um, so is their commitment to it an integral part of their identity? Um, so does it, it define who they are in a social, cultural, religious, or political context? Um, or is it you know, not as important to who they see themselves as in the world. Um, so the first thing that we have to do, um, you know, as, as people who are trying to resolve misconceptions with other people, teachers who are trying to resolve misconceptions with students is really understand a little bit about what it takes um, to, you know, approach and resolve different types of misconceptions. Um, so we know that two things are very, very important for teachers. Um, the first, obviously, is content knowledge. So if teachers don't have um, a background in the content that they're teaching, or if they don't have a lot of content knowledge, 
then it's going to be very difficult for them to resolve misconceptions because they might hold misconceptions themselves or they might not be aware of what misconceptions exist um, for their students. Um, so on the left-hand side of this graph, we can see that content knowledge is extremely important, um, but it's uh, not the only thing that, that matters for teachers and students. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side of this graph that teachers who had a high subject matter knowledge, high knowledge of the content that they're teaching, um, had students who were very successful at overturning misconceptions um, compared to teachers um, with a low subject matter knowledge. But this is only in regard to questions that do not have misconceptions surrounding them. Um, so if we're looking at simple, straightforward, factual content knowledge, um, then it's important for a teacher to know a lot about that content. Um, and their students will be more successful than teachers without a high content knowledge. But this is only in regard to questions that do not have misconceptions surrounding them. So if we're looking at questions that do have misconceptions around them, uh, teachers who only have a high subject matter knowledge, um, their students don't really perform significantly higher than teachers who have a low subject matter knowledge. The thing that makes a difference here is that teachers have a high subject matter knowledge and a high knowledge of student misconceptions. So that's when we see significant growth with students. If the teacher both knows their content really well and understands misconceptions, what misconceptions students might be bringing in and how to appropriately resolve those with students. So although content knowledge is important, um, it is also important to have a good understanding of student misconceptions. Uh, another thing from a, a similar study uh, is that not all misconceptions are equal. Um, so as we talked about, there are three components. We have the strength, we have the coherence, and we have the commitment. Um, so in misconceptions that are weak, which means that there's not a very high strength, coherence, or commitment, um, just having content knowledge will be enough to help teachers, um, you know, resolve those misconceptions with their students. And you can see that here in blue. Um, so in blue, we have teachers who only have a high subject matter knowledge. Uh, that's going to be enough to significantly resolve misconceptions with their students as compared to a teacher who doesn't have a high subject matter knowledge. If we're looking at strong misconceptions, those that are sticky and, and difficult to deal with, um, in blue, again, we can see that teachers who only have a high subject matter knowledge do not significantly um, resolve those misconceptions with their students. Uh, so the only teachers who are able to significantly move their students um, in terms of resolving those strong, sticky misconceptions are teachers with high subject matter knowledge and a high knowledge of student misconceptions. Um, so let's take a look at what kinds of misconceptions students might be coming into the classroom with. Uh, and these typically fall into four or five uh, major categories. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, misconception is kind of a catch-all term for a lot of different things that students might be bringing in. Um, so we have, so here I've grouped them into four major categories. Uh, we have preconceived notions or factual misconceptions, um, vernacular misconceptions, conceptual misunderstandings, uh, and non-scientific or non-academic beliefs. So we'll walk through these. I'll explain a little bit about what they are and give some examples. Um, but keeping in mind uh, the previous um, graphic, um, there is a difference between strong and weak. So the two at the top, preconceived notions and factual misconceptions and vernacular misconceptions would fall into that weak category. Um, so most of the time, teachers who have a high content knowledge will be able to get through these and resolve them with their students. The two at the bottom, conceptual misunderstandings and non-scientific beliefs, are going to be a little stickier. So these are going to take content knowledge uh, and knowledge of student misconceptions on the teacher's part. 
Um, so the first group of misconceptions are preconceived notions or factual misconceptions. Uh, so these are unchallenged popular conceptions rooted in everyday experiences or colloquialisms, um, so common sayings in, in the culture. Um, so these are very, very common. Students come in with a lot of these um, because it's things that they have experienced. Um, so they, because of their anecdotal experiences, um, they think they have a good fully formed concept of the phenomenon that they're observing, um, when in actuality they might be mistaken. Um, so let's look at a couple of examples. So one that I've heard before is we just had a blizzard, so the earth isn't really warming. Um, so this, you know, it, it's a logical progression for young students uh, and even for adults um, where they experience cold weather. Um, so they don't think that the earth is warming because of that single incidence of cold weather. Um, another example, which is a, a colloquialism, is lightning doesn't strike in the same place twice. Um, so they might have heard someone say this um, in reference to something else um, because it's a common saying. Um, but that is literally the job of lightning rods. <laughs> lightning rods are designed so that lightning strikes in the same place repeatedly and not somewhere else that we don't want it to strike. Um, so other preconceived notions um, might be something uh, in, you know, we have a young elementary school student who watches the sun come up every morning and they go down in the afternoon. So to that young student, it seems as if the sun is moving across the sky. Um, so they might think that the sun moves in relation to the earth. Um, but it's pretty simple to clear this up once we show them models of the solar system and how the earth rotates. Uh, and that's what makes it appear that the sun is moving across the sky. Um, so like I said, preconceived notions and factual misconceptions are pretty easy to clear up. These typically fall in the weak misconception category. Uh, where all it's going to take to clear these up uh, is an explanation of how that phenomenon actually works, um, and then some repeated practice and allowing students to dig into the evidence surrounding that. Um, so these are, are very, very common, but they're usually pretty easy to, to rectify. Uh, the next type of misconception uh, is vernacular misconception. So vernacular referring to the language that we're using in a given circumstance. Um, so these are also fairly common. Uh, these arise when the words that we use in everyday life uh, mean something different in a scientific or academic context. Um, so there are lots of words in science and you know, technical specific disciplines uh, that are used differently than, than we use them in everyday life. Um, so probably the most common uh, that I get as a biology teacher is the word theory. Um, so students saying something like evolution's only a theory. Um, we use that word theory differently in everyday speak than we use it in uh, a scientific context. So uh, when everyday people are saying, I have a theory about something, they're usually meaning that they have a guess or maybe they have a hypothesis about how something works. Um, in science, we use the word theory very differently. Uh, so we are not meaning a guess or a hypothesis. We are meaning this is the best explanation that we have to explain how this phenomenon works. And it's supported by multiple lines of evidence from many different scientific disciplines. Um, so again, just walking through students, uh, walking through with students what that terminology means, um, directly saying, this is what I mean when I say this word in this context, I don't mean this other definition of the term, um, and being very consistent with how you are using words. Um, another example that we've seen uh, is uh, the misconception about glaciers retreating. Um, so when glaciers retreat, um, we don't mean that they kind of stand up and turn around and walk backwards. 
Uh, what we mean is that um, the, the ice is melting faster than it's being accumulated. Uh, so the glacier is shrinking. Um, so again, that word retreat is used differently in this context than it's used in normal everyday speech. Um, so I'm sure that you can think of lots of other examples of words uh, that are used differently in one context as opposed to a scientific context. But again, this one is fairly easy to overturn. Um, we just have to be very clear and intentional with the words that we're using, define them for the students, and have the teachers and students practice them consistently. Um, so the next uh, category of misconceptions, which moves over into the strong category, uh, which are a little trickier to, to resolve with students, are conceptual misunderstandings. Um, so these are things um, in which students are taught some scientific or academic concept uh, in a way that they don't have to confront any conflicts between their new concept and their prior misunderstandings. Um, so this one can be very tricky because sometimes it's complex to tease out. What does the student know? What are they assuming? Um, do they have a complete knowledge model for this in their, in their minds? Uh, or are they kind of putting it together piecemeal where we have some good solid bits of understanding with some misconceptions all put together? Um, so these can be tricky for teachers because they really have to listen to students' responses. Um, they might have to do some really pointed questioning in the classroom uh, to get out whether the student really knows the topic or whether they have some misconceptions that are kind of embedded in there uh, or some incomplete understandings. Um, so one good example that we, we experience when we're teaching about climate change um, is students saying something like greenhouse gases aren't a problem because carbon dioxide is good for plants. Uh, so you can see how tricky this is. So a student might have learned about photosynthesis and they might know that carbon dioxide is needed for plants to undergo photosynthesis. Um, so they might think that carbon dioxide is always a good thing because it's needed for plants. We need plants to photosynthesize. Um, so they might think that carbon dioxide is always a good thing. Um, so again, this is going to take um, some finesse um, and uh, really take the teacher, getting the student to understand that yes, carbon dioxide is needed for this, but too much carbon dioxide can cause problems um, because carbon dioxide is not only a nutrient for plants, it is also a greenhouse gas. Um, that can cause problems in very large amounts. Uh, another conceptual misunderstanding that I've come across in my classroom uh, are students thinking that all bacteria are bad all the time. Uh, so again, they might have learned a little bit about bacteria, a little bit about diseases and infections. They might have heard about bacteria uh, on TV or from their doctor. Um, if they've ever had an infection, like strep throat or staph, um, so they might just have this assumption that, okay, these bacteria are bad, so it must mean that all bacteria are bad all the time. Um, so again, that's just going to take um, some very clear instruction uh, about what are bacteria, what are the different kinds of bacteria, what are the different relationships and roles that bacteria serve in different ecosystems. Um, so even though there are a small percentage of bacteria that are parasitic and can cause diseases in humans, most bacteria, the overwhelming majority, are commensalistic, so they, they really don't affect us at all, uh, or they're mutualistic, they're beneficial, um, so they provide ecosystem services like decomposition of materials, um, they might provide vitamins in our digestive tract that we can absorb. Um, so, you know, kind of explaining the finer details uh, and, and you know, being very intentional about how we're showing them the big picture um, is very important in breaking these down. Um, the last is probably the most sticky uh, and the most tricky 
uh, when we're we're dealing with students and and you know even adults in the general public. And this category of um, strong misconceptions is sometimes called non-scientific or non-academic beliefs. Um, so this is when views uh, that students hold um, about a scientific topic come from sources other than formal education. Um, so this might be, you know, the media, movies, television, social media. It might be religious teachings, political teachings, cultural teachings. Um, so they hold the view of a scientific concept that doesn't fit with the scientific consensus on that topic because they've learned some alternative from somewhere else. Um, so some good examples of this uh, are, you know, I'm sure that you can think of lots, but these are two that are fairly common. Um, so a student believing in, you know, that hears that believing in evolution means that you can't believe in God or be religious. Um, so this is more common in some places than others. Um, but obviously this is not true, right? We do have lots of members of clergy that fully understand and accept the process of evolution by natural selection, as well as scientists who do follow different religious faiths uh, and practices. Um, so, you know, this is gonna take some, uh, some time and building relationships with students uh, and maybe showing them role models, people, you know, who have no problem uh, believing one thing and also accepting uh, this, you know, the scientific evidence and consensus for this topic. Um, another example that I get, um, not as frequently, but every once in a while, is astrology. So students believing that uh, the alignment of stars and planets and other celestial bodies uh, have some kind of impact on human behavior. Um, so again, this is going to be tricky because this can be really ingrained in students, um, you know, identities and, and cultural practices or our beliefs. Um, so again, working with them, showing them evidence uh, to the contrary um, can help to kind of release these non-scientific beliefs. Okay, so here's a recap. Uh, so we said that, you know, we can have lots of different types of misconceptions that can pop up in different ways. Uh, the two categories at the top are usually a little easier to resolve with students. The two categories at the bottom can be a little trickier to resolve with students. All right, so how do, uh, how do we, you know, get through these? So if we find out what a student's misconception is, what are they coming into the classroom um, you know, thinking or, or believing or understanding, um, and how can we help students resolve these misconceptions and come to a more solid scientific understanding of phenomena? Um, so the first thing that we have to understand is there is always an interaction between the learner and the message. So the message being the instruction that the teacher is giving, the curriculum that the teacher is using, um, discussions that they're having between one another. Uh, so what we know from research is that if the interaction between the learner and the message occurs in a positive manner, um, then the individual's commitment to that misconception is likely to loosen, and they're going to be more willing to process new information, you know, listen to it, take it in, think about it, engage with it, and then maybe come to a better understanding of that concept. Um, so in order to do that, the National Center for Science Education um, has some kind of guidelines and tips for how teachers and students should be interacting. And we call those our brave classroom practices, which I'll talk about more in just a second. Um, so just common sense things um, like being empathetic, kind of understanding where your student is coming from, respecting them their beliefs, their identities, asking questions to get to the root of their understanding, um, making sure that all students value mistakes, um, know that everyone makes mistakes, mistakes are okay, they're part of the learning process, they're part of the scientific process, and really trying to ease tensions as much as possible. So don't escalate things um, you know, needlessly, always try and, and smooth things over meet students where they are, and then work from there. 
Um, so these brave classroom practices will make sure that the learner is open and willing to accept what the teacher is giving them. And that's if that first step doesn't happen, then teachers are never going to get through to a student who might hold a misconception. Uh, the second thing that's helpful um, in approaching misconceptions with students is giving the students a really solid foundation in the nature of science. So if students don't understand how the process of science works, if they don't understand, under, understand things like scientific consensus and meta-analyses and peer review process um, and, you know, controlled experiments, um, then they really have no reason to accept what you're saying. Um, so really getting the students to understand what science actually is and how it's practiced, once they have that understanding, then they'll be more open and willing to see, okay, this misconception that I have is really incoherent, it's really weak, it doesn't fit with the way that scientists gather and evaluate data and come to conclusions. Um, so a solid understanding of the nature of science and good relationships with students using um, you know, the approach of, of something like the brave classroom practices, being empathetic, not judging the students or, or you know, not having the students judge one another, um, using friendly language, friendly demeanor, um, asking lots of questions to try and get to the root of what's, you know, what's causing an issue here. Um, again, valuing mistakes and easing tension. So uh, it is okay for us not to know something. It's okay for us to dig deeper. Let's do it together. Let's learn together. Let's resolve these misconceptions together. Um, in the next video, we will go through the rest of this uh, cognitive reconstruction of knowledge model um, and really dig into the other parts. So now that we have a good understanding of what the student's misconceptions might be, uh, the next step is looking at everything else. Um, how can we get students to um, let go of that misconception? What are the, the qualities of good curriculum and instruction um, that will allow the teacher to help the student resolve that misconception? Uh, and how can we move forward together?